got to it. <laughs> All right, good special. Miss Jennifer always gets it right before too long. That's not pointing out that I'm just saying you, you always get it right once you get going. I, I've never heard you hammer down though like a few weeks ago. Um, still yeah. the blood yeah. crushed that thing, man. You should listen to that before you go door knocking. It'll help you. Apparently, you guys not been listening to it because you're not door knocking. <laughs> um. Habakkuk cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. And he prays, Revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known in wrath, remember mercy. Now, I don't want to take this text out of contest. It's really to the nation of Judah. Um, it's not a cry from a church that's doing the right thing, revive us again. Though it can be a cry or a plea or one of those unspoken requests that you say to God, you don't know if God's going to do it, you kind of wonder what revival is. Um, and so here it was known that judgment was coming because of a severe, severe backsliding of the nation, of the kings, of the prophets. And so God says, I'm going to lower the boom on you. Well, in, in the book of Psalms, the, it almost says the same thing, but it's from a different um, vantage point, a different viewpoint. Habakkuk said, man, it's coming. Oh, Lord, before it comes, revive. Please don't let this happen. But it happened anyway. Uh, the Assyrians came, Sennacherib, um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar with the Babylonians. And so here, though, the psalmist says, the psalm of David, he says, Will thou not revive us again? that thy people may rejoice in thee. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us salvations. And so I believe God wants a church or a nation or, a, or a what have you uh, to have what revival. Um, let me give you a little bit of Bible history and a little bit of preaching and a little bit of teaching, and then some, I'll throw some grenades in your lap. <clears throat> and then you can either toss them out or toss the person next to you or you can bow your head and get right or grow. Um, I, I, I always make this promise, and I, I don't always make this promise, but I make promises about time. Time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping <laughs> into the future. Um, but I think I'll be done by a quarter after 12, which gives me 31 minutes. Um, so I want to say this. If you can listen to me for 31 minutes, I can stand looking at your faces for 31 minutes. <laughs> so smile and agree and say amen and say whoopee and say hallelujah and bring those plates back up here. Pass them again. Let me get some, some, some Bible history real quick. Bible history. In the Old Testament, you have six sections. The law, and I should put these in order, but I didn't. The law, the books of poetry, uh, the prophets, major and minor prophets, the books, of, the wisdom books, and historical books. In the New Testament, there are five, seven, and I didn't learn this out of college. I think I just discovered it, or maybe I picked it up somewhere. But in the New Testament, you have the Gospels. Then you have historical book, which would be the book of Acts. Then you have the Epistles. Uh, Romans, Corinthians, etc. And then you have pastoral letters, Timothy and Titus, a personal letter, Philemon, and then prophecy, the book of John. So you find 989 in the old, 260 in the new. What was, what's this book all about right here? That book I just described in a, in a moment or two, this book right here, 1189 chapters, uh, 929, 260, um, uh, you've got uh, uh, your different sections. This book is, what is that book right there? That book is the story of God's interaction with mankind. It tells in the beginning of God's uh, highest uh, creation. Uh, that was uh, man, a God formed man out of the, the dust, the clay of the earth. The Bible says he breathed into him and he became a, a living soul. Uh, I don't think breath made him alive only. He had to have some blood in there. So Adam was uh, created by God with a, a no sin in his blood, and he had the breath of God. The, he had strength. 
that was God's highest creation. Uh, soul, uh, uh, animals don't have a soul. Plants don't have a soul. Fish uh, don't have a soul. No matter how much we love our pets, whether they be little pets, little chihuahua dogs, <clears throat> or, um, uh, you know, you keep a tiger in your backyard, no matter what, a pets don't have souls. Your goldfish, hate to tell you this little Johnny, doesn't have a soul, and your dad flushed it down the toilet. It's not really swimming in the ocean looking for children. You, didn't, you, you guys, yeah, Ryan's breaking down in tears. What? You let old waggly tail go in the ocean? Yes, he's living happily ever after. No souls. See, that means if that's true, that if God's interaction with mankind, and it is, and his highest creation is man and his interaction with man, and it's true, um, since God created man, that means uh, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is just that. It's a theory. It's unfortunate that evolution caught on, and it's, uh, you can't even say, well, it's in the public schools. Please, it's been in the public schools for years and years and years. When you teach children that um, God didn't create them, that they come from animals, then why are we surprised when they act like animals? Why are we surprised when, and by the way, the changes that have happened in America over the years are just unbelievable. We should pray, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years in wrath, remember mercy. Because this nation, I love my nation. I love the United States of America. I think you do too. I believe in saluting the flag. I was in the military. I'm, you know, I'm pro uh, defense, uh, whatnot. But our leadership is, is it, it's always been that way. I'm just going to crack on Democrats and Biden. No, you can. I, I can't even get started. And I don't even watch news anymore. I already know enough. It's just old stuff. Old. They just turn out old stuff. The people that were murdered in Idaho, man, I, I, my heart breaks for them. I can't imagine it. But it was a month ago, so stop telling me about it. Give me something new. Tell me something different. Tell me something I can sink my teeth into. Well, my part of my teeth. <laughs> and so it's the same old stuff. So all governments fail. All governments fail. The Bible says when the Lord comes back, the government will be on his shoulder. That means he Amen. takes care of business. But up until the end, governments fail. So we're headed in that direction, and it's no, it's no wonder. Now, the first man, what was his name? Adam. And he had a wife, Eve. And they were, they were um, uh, in the garden. And it tells of the fall, the serpent that uh, beguiled um, Eve, and then Adam ate and sin came. It goes on to tell, this book goes on to tell about uh, how God uh, uh, told um, uh, Adam and Eve to kill, a, bring a, um, a blood offering. And God, from the very beginning, made a way for people, uh, not just his people, but any people, a way back to him. And we'll say it this way, in his good graces, and that was through the blood of Christ. And they knew it back then, and we know it now. If you go to church and your faith, you know, you believe the word of God, then you know Jesus died on a cross for our sins. And it's the blood which cleanses us, wipes away all sin. And then God tells about Noah, how he saved the world. Uh, eight souls, uh, Noah, his wife, three boys, and their three wives were saved through the ark. Then it goes on to tell us many, many things. But then about Israel and the promises to Abraham and told him to be a father of a, a great nation. And uh, this promise to Abraham was because of obedience. The blessings on Abraham were because of his obedience. Uh, sometimes delayed obedience, but delayed obedience. Somebody, delayed obedience is no obedience at all. Yeah, well, I'd rather the kid take the trash out 15 minutes after he said he would than um, say, well, no, if you're not going to do it right now, don't do it. So delayed, don't, don't, don't bite on that. You uh, uh, used to have some candy. Uh, Brother Eddie got it, and it, 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 it was real sweet and covered in, you know, sugar. It tasted good. But then when you got into it a little bit, it tasted like rotten fish. Yeah. <laughs> now, I don't know because I don't know what rotten fish tastes like, but I know what it smelled like, and it's like foul, and you'd get this candy, and you wouldn't really realize. It was a great joke. You should, <laughs> we worked that thing for a long time, didn't we? We passed out a lot of candy those days. Oh, would you like some candy? About 20 minutes, about two minutes later out of the parking lot, they're spitting it out. Yuck. <clears throat> But these, these, these blessings, so delayed obedience. So pro, the promise to Abraham was because of obedience. The blessings because of obedience. The prosperity that Abraham enjoyed because of obedience. Moses uh, did great things through obedience. Joshua, obedience. David, obedience. All these great heroes of the faith. And if you want to know all about them, read uh, Hebrews chapter 11. 
Read Hebrews chapter 11. I'll tell you about it. So that's a little bit about Bible history. Now let me give you a little bit about American history. Here's American history. I'm going to jump right into it. George Washington on New Year's morning, 1777, he had 3,000 soldiers. Before that, he'd had 20,000 soldiers in, in the year of 76, and they rallied to him. On December 25th and 26th, he decided they have to cross the Delaware and march nine miles through the snow and bitter, bitter weather to attack 300, to attack 1,500 Hessians. Now, what was a Hessian? It was like a mercenary, a soldier for hire. They were from Germany. Uh, back then, it wasn't called Germany, so um, uh, uh, they weren't called Germans, but they were called Hessians, and they were mercenaries. So here come 300 of George Washington's against 1,500. That's one to five, one for the good guys, five for the bad guys. And they march the nine miles in the bitter snow, and they have no care. They take the town. They take the armory. They defeat. No kill, no KIA, and only two wounded. So he went back, camped on the other side of the Delaware, and George Con uh, General Cornwallis, came with 5,500 men. And he came and, and here, now listen now, here Washington, he, he only had 3,000. He defeats 15,000, he gets everything he can, all the cannons, all the, all the food stuff, all the clothing, everything he could get, and, and, and called the booty of war. He takes everything, the spoils of war. He goes back, he crosses back over the Delaware, and General Cornwallis, who should have been there, um, uh, the English general should have been there on Christmas morning. Said they were all partying, drinking wine. Back in the day, that's a good way to party, but if, don't party at all. But uh, back, back in the, did anybody catch that? Uh, back in the day, I'm trying to get my old, you know, routine back. Uh, back in the day, they didn't, they didn't have war at night. They didn't have, they didn't have war in, the, in wintertime. So everybody's all camped out, safe and sound. But George Washington said, Man, and he's praying in the snow, saying, God, help us. God, help this nation. God, he would have been hung for treason. It would have been bad news if the Continental Army didn't win. And after he, he uh, takes the bit in his teeth, and he, with 3,000, marches against 15,000 and takes it, then G George Cor Cornwallis, General Cornwallis, who was supposed to be there, he shows up late with 5,500 men, and he comes down the Delaware, you know, he's followed where he went, comes down there, and he looks across. Uh, the Delaware is quite large, runs through Philadelphia. It's a huge, huge wide river. And he looks across, and he sees all these campfires burning. Campfires burning. And he says, man, Washington, he just went to the other side of the river and parked it. He's camped out there. He, he took the town of Trenton. He took all, all, this, uh, all the stores. He took all the ammunition. Um, they used to have projectiles, grenades back then, rocket flares and stuff. They had things that associated with gunpowder, and, and they could do those things. So took, all, took everything he could carry, all the plunder, and he's on the other side. But Washington knew the surprise attack worked, but he's not ready with three to face 55. He's just not ready. So he sets all these fires, and then he books. He leaves some guys behind, 15, 20 guys, to tend the fires. Big wood burning all night. And Cornwallis on this side, uh, you know, we don't have to get after him now. He's, gonna, he's obviously staying there all night. But Washington took his army and left. So here this guy's looking across the river. Oh, I see the fires. I can wait. But Washington was gone. And by the time Cornwallis got across the river, uh, Washington was 40 miles away into the interior of Pennsylvania. So, so uh, American history was encapsulated in that one night when George Washington changed it uh, uh, from what it was and won back the, the um, uh, momentum of the war. There's a later fight where George Washington, is in, the, the, the Continental Army, they're, they're running, not pell-mell retreat, but they're backing off thinking they're overwhelmed. And here Washington's watching from a hill in the spyglass, and he sees what's happening. So he rides his, uh, his uh, big white charger, his horse, and he, run, he rides out there. He has uh, bullets flying everywhere, run, going through his coat, going through his pants, knocking his hat off. And he's got a saber flashing, and he's flashing and slashing, and he's crying for his men, follow me, man, follow me, men, follow me, rally to me. 
and the Continental Army did rally to Washington, and they won the day. After that, enlistments swelled. His legend of Washington was established, and from that day on, the Continental Army with George Washington was a force to be feared. Now, when we think of what, by the way, we covered all of New Jersey. We captured the cannons and, and, the, and the horses, etc. Now, how'd they do that? Here's how they did it. They had a winning spirit. They had a winning attitude. They had an attitude that says, I can do it. My kids were growing up. We have some mottos. I don't know if they're in the front of this Bible. But one of them was, I can make a great man. Now, I heard that somewhere. I think Henry Ford said it. My kids said it every night. I, now, this is not a crack on you. Most of you don't. I don't know what your kids are saying every night, but you ought to sit them down after dinner time. They ought to sit around and get your Bible out and tell them stories from the Bible and uh, they ought to memorize some scriptures and you ought to teach them. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. You should teach them uh, uh, um, how shall a young man cleanse his way or young woman by taking heed thereto according to this word. And I'm going to tell you, I raised six and it was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Now, I don't even know how they're all going to turn out. There's one of them sitting right there. And uh, I don't know where the rest of them are here. There's one right there. They're still, they're in their 30s. Man, I don't know what's going to happen. Are they going to make it into their 60s? Will they, will they continue to uh, prosper? John, uh, 3 John verse 2 says, uh, I want your, uh, your uh, soul to prosper. Even as your, um, basically says your life, uh, not just your life and your children and your finances and your robe, uh, 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 wardrobe and your uh, resume, but I want your soul to prosper. I want Jake's soul to pl- prosper. I want Teresa and Benjamin and, and Jamal and Jessica and Sarah, no matter what happens. And I'm going to tell you, in our family, I don't care if the preacher family or not, bad things happen. Bumpy roads come. Uh, ditches uh, uh, jump out of nowhere. Deer appear, and you run into it, and you wreck your car, you turn it over. Uh, somebody gets hurt, and you get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning, or so the, the sheriff knocks on your door. And, you, of course, I'm, like, hiding and saying, tell them I'm not here. Tell them I'm not here. And they say, are you so-and-so? And, and they say, we, and of course, I'm not even opening the door. I don't, you say, well, what's your attitude toward policemen? I love policemen as long as they're in their car and I'm in my house. But, but I don't, well, I better stop with that. But, and they come and they say, um, are you Douglas Jackson? Are you the father of uh, Jessica uh, Swaffer? And I say, yes. And, and um, they tell me, or maybe, maybe it's Sarah, and, the, and the, the police come and tell Brother Dan. And Brother Dan, he doesn't even know how to process. And he says, Sarah was hit by a car, uh, um, whatever, shopping at Walmart. <laughs> Taken down, boy. Life's not a bump on the road. Life's a bumpy road. And I don't, I don't believe in beating a dead horse. But uh, th- this time last year, uh, Kirsten was just being afflicted with her paralysis. Man, you talk about a body blow. You talk about if I wanted to be a griper or a complainer or negative, I could be. In fact, I could get mad at God. I could get upset with God. I could get ticked off with God. When I get ticked off, I get ticked off. And I'm honest about it. If I'm mad at you, you'll know. Uh, uh, If I'm mad at God, he'll know. I have been mad at God before. You have been mad at God before. No sense in saying you haven't been. We all have been. But it's that spirit. Suppose all the soldiers got mad at George Washington. Suppose all the prophets got mad at God. Suppose Moses got mad at God. Suppose Job got, suppose David said, hey, I got big brothers out here. Let them go fight Goliath. Hey, I got, that, that, that's Saul back there. He's head and shoulders above all the people. Let him go fight Goliath. Suppose Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been like that. What? We were doing right. We were going to church. We were in Sunday school. We were obeying our parents. And what happens? We get taken into captivity. Now they're going to make us bow before this. Uh, we might as well give up. They didn't say that. They didn't say that. And we're not supposed to, we're supposed to have a heart, look, get this, faint yet pursuing. Man, I don't need big long speeches. That's faint yet pursuing. Man, I like that. Tired out, hooked, worked, calluses. Or pain, or maybe you, maybe you ladies were cooking, and you, uh, that's something that you do in the kitchen. <laughs> it's called cooking. 
You got to have pots and pans. And you're cooking and maybe some grease splatters. You're cooking for your big, lazy husband. And something uh, splat splatter your ungrateful family. And something pops out and, and pops maybe some eggs or something. And it, 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 it splatters on your hands. And maybe it burns more than you think. It, look, life is going to continually throw roadblocks at us. I, I hate to tell you, I'm 64, and life has not gotten easier for me inside. Man, when I used to be the pastor here, buddy, I was hammered down. I got up in the morning, 6 a.m., every day of the world. Uh, that's if I could sleep. I had a to-do list, read my Bible, pray, and psh, I'm on it. Whatever it was, I did, I, I did a lot of things back then. A lot of work took care of a lot of things. Well, now that I'm older, I don't have that same schedule. So since the schedule's not pushing me, what has to push me? Who, get, who has to push me? Right, Drew? I got to push me. And I, I hate pushing me. Remember how we're learning in, in midweek about the mind controlling the body? My mind a lot of times says you're hurt, you're in pain. Um, and that, it's true sometimes. But anybody here that's an adult has pain. You know, there's a reason that people, older people, let me find this, turn it on. It's going to work for me. Hold it down. Hold it down. There's, there's a reason, and I've used this illustration before, there's a reason older people walk like this. Or like this. Or, or, or if they can walk at all. Or like this, like this. We talked to a guy yesterday, I can't do it. Brother Joe could do it, he had a hip replaced. He kind of rolled when he walked. Got kind of rolled when he walked. We were, in fact, Kevin, we were at back in the break room getting some, some tea. Guy came in, huge dude, huge. I mean, looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger with clothes on. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I don't know what our, or Arnold looked like without his clothes on. Okay, he's a big, do you know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? Bodybuilder, okay, bodybuilder. Yeah, this guy was huge. And I, he was in the room for a few seconds, and Jake and I were talking. Somebody left, and I walked over to him. Stand up, Luke. And I walked over to him. I said, man, I said, I hate guys like you. Did I or did I not? This guy could have rolled me up into a ball and punted me back from where we were in Michigan. You can sit down now. We'll say, what's that all about? Here's this guy, great big bodybuilder. Uh, references these um, well-known uh, uh, weightlifters, and he walks like this. Kind of rolled when he walked. You know what I'm talking? Kind of rolled when he walked. All that guy's working out, probably thousands of hours of lifting. It didn't prevent his body from breaking down. When you get old, he's 64 years old, same as I. <clears throat> he looked older than I did, though. <laughs> the body breaks down. Amen, Brother Stoltz? Yeah. Body breaks down. Amen, Miss Jennifer? Yeah. Body breaks down. Hey, amen, Tom? I, every one of you out here, we can call names. Miss Eve, Brother Joe, Miss Jackson's home today, sick, doesn't feel good, has to stay home, doesn't want to, but whoops, doesn't want to, but has to. Now, the history of our Bible, synopsis, the history of the United States, synopsis, and the synopsis is, is what captured, what kept those men and women of the Old Testament going? What kept the disciples of Christ and the people that heard the gospel and the people that followed Jesus, what kept them going in the face of adversity, in the face of enemies, in the face of uh, just uh, life's uh, burdens and life's hurdles? Here's what it was. They had a winning spirit. They had a winning attitude. George Washington said the, the password is this, victory or death. Victory or death. Now, I like that stuff. Victory or death. And all, every one of those continental 3,000 soldiers knew that was it. We're either marching to victory or we're marching to death. And in our church, we should feel like, oh Lord, revive this work in the midst of the earth. We should pray, oh Lord, revive me in the midst of my years. Cause me to have more uh, internal fire. Cause me to, to shed more tears. Cause my heart to soften. To a, I was going to pray for Brother Bachman this morning in my prayer time. And the Holy Spirit, I don't know if it's Holy Spirit, but I'm like, it's like, why pray for Brother Bachman? He's got about 14 billion people praying for him. 
think, Doug, who needs prayer the most? I'm like, I reckon people don't get prayed for much. And two or three names came to my mind right away. Is that amazing? But you got to go to a prayer closet. You got to talk to God. You want your heart to David said, while I was musing, the fire burned. While I was thinking about God's power, the fire burned. You know, when David was with Goliath and David beat Goliath, why? His spirit. When Elijah was on Mount Carmel with Ahab and Jezebel and called down fire, how did he do that? His spirit. In fact, when Elisha's, uh, uh, Elijah was going to be taken to heaven, Elisha would not leave Elijah's side as he prepared to go. And he said to Elisha, ask what you want from me. And Eli Elisha said, a double portion. And Elijah said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go up, you're going to get a double portion. And the Bible is clear about it that Elijah had eight known miracles and Elisha, his protege, had 16 known miracles. God gave a promise and God kept the promise. It took years to, for it to go. I mean, when he, Elisha got that promise, he just started out. He just getting going. Elijah was the man. He thought, you know, he carried Elijah's uh, water bucket. He took care of Elijah, you know, washed the laundry and made the fire and cooked the food. He took care of the man of God. When God said, I'm going to take uh, uh, Elijah to heaven, Elijah, God told Elijah, Elijah told Elijah, Elijah hey, I'm going up. <clears throat> Ask what you will. And Eli I don't know how long he thought about it. I don't know if he meditated on it, but he said, he said, um, I want a double portion. He said, I like what I see out of you, Elisha, and I want some more of it. He said, hey, Lord, revive thy work <clears throat> in the midst of the years. Revive me. That ought to be the prayer of every person here. Not revive our nation. Man, that's 350 million people. You going to pray for them? Revive our, revive our uh, city. Revive our church. That's a good one. How about revive our marriage? So we've only been married two years. Well, that's Probably about time for revi revival. Kids steal the joy, boy. Kids just suck all the life out of you. My advice is wait to get married till you're about late 30s and marry a good breadwinner if you're a girl. Uh, <clears throat> if you're a guy, marry a woman that can cook and, and pucker. And, and um, uh, uh, don't have any children. You say, well, <laughs> what will happen to the world? It'd probably be a quieter place. <laughs> See, they were also, Esther said, here's this winning spirit now, the winning spirit of the word of God, the winning spirit of Jesus Christ, the winning spirit of John the Baptist, the winning spirit of George Washington, the winning spirit of Elijah and Elisha and David and Nehemiah said, when he said, you better run away, you better split, we're coming to get you in the night. And Nehemiah said, I don't know what else he said, but he, I bet Nehemiah talked trash. I bet he said, hey, why don't you come over now? What are you waiting on? Oh, what's the problem? Oh, you're going to come get, and that's the way you do it. Better watch out, I'm going to come get you. What kind of, now, what's wrong with now? Right, right now. And I believe that Nehemiah talked big to those guys. He yeah. said, should such a man as I flee? Esther, yeah. uh, when she had to go in and see the king, when, when uh, wicked Haman had a plan to destroy the Jews, she said, Esther said, if I perish, I perish. She laid it all on the line. She said, victory or death. Wow. Revive thy work. What's that word mean? Revive. Make alive again or make more alive. Well, when make alive again? When make more alive? When is revival needed? In the midst of the years. In the midst of the years. And if a person compares, you know, Brand new Baptist church to Three Rivers Baptist Church. Oh, it's new and it's exciting. It's new, it's new, it's new. That's probably bad, it's bad, it's bad. I want the old, the old, the old. I want the old hymns and the old fellowship and the old propriety and the old manners and the old respect for elders and the old attention to preaching and the old. That's what I want. I want the old. I'm not looking for the new, baby. I want the old. I want people uh, 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 like Jennifer, when she comes back, I want somebody to ask her about it. She's going to say, man, I went to that church all, for a long, long time, and I was away for a long time, and when I went back, it was the same old stuff. Amen. I don't want to walk back in here and find me preaching from a non-King James. Why? Because I believe that. You say, well, I'm not King James. I don't know why you are. I don't know why you always say that. Or, or you say, well, that's good for you, preacher, but this is good for me. Jesus said, man shall not live by, listen now, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by, wait for it, every word. Yeah, that's right. So I need some kind of every word. Bible. So, hey, here's what I say. If the English Standard Version is a every word Bible, use it. If the NIV, the New International Vision uh, Version, is a every word Bible, use it. If uh, uh, the Rennes Douai, which is two cities in France where they, where they took uh, the wrong uh, text, the perverted text from Alexandria, uh, Egypt, and they, and they put together the Catholic Bible in two cities, Rennes, R-H-E-I-M-S, and Douai, D-O-U-Y-A-Y. If that's the right Bible, if the Catholic Bible, if, hey, if that's it, man, if that's it. But you got to have an every word Bible if you're going to live a Christian life. Yeah. Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Wow. Make alive again. And you, can, you can't compare brand new Baptist to TRBC. You know, I, I want the old, the old. I want the revived, not the new. I mean, I want the old to become new again, like the Valley Dry Bones. You know, if you're here today, the Christian life is exciting, especially when it's new. Uh, just as TRBC used to be. You say, well, we aren't, we aren't exactly like we used to be. You Preacher, aren't as funny as you used to be. You're not as exciting as you used to be. But Jesus is. Amen. Jesus is. And so what are we going to do around here? What are we going to do? Well, what are we going to pray? I hope. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Revive thy work in the midst of the years. Now, what's the Lord want us to do? Here's the Numbers 11, 23. God said, is the Lord's hand waxed short that it cannot work? Isaiah 50, verse 2, is my hand shortened that it cannot save? God says it over twice, once in Genesis, I think Genesis 18, 14, and Jeremiah 32, something. He says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything? Is there anything too hard for your marriage to get worked out? Uh, Miss Jackson and I, we have quarreled our whole life. Full disclosure. Now, I don't mean we fight like dog, cats and dogs. But we have often, on, we went through months, man, of just wonderful uh, that's not maternal, that's not the right word. Wonderful marriage. Wonderful being together. And then we went through days where it's like, I hate your guts. And I don't know why I married you. And I say, well, honey, did you get that how it turned out? Now, you're not that way, though. You never quarrel about the checkbook. You never argue about dirty dishes. You don't, never get upset about the bed not made. In our house, I, I like keeping house. I know it sounds kind of weird, but I told you I went to a gay bar. Um, <laughs> I like doing dishes. I like cleaning out the microwave. I like wiping down the refrigerator. Miss Jackson has a hard time bending her knees, and I can still get down on. Uh, I can still get down and clean out the refrigerator. I can do things like that. I like doing laundry. We do all kinds of laundry towels. I like folding laundry. You believe that or not? I like making things right. I'm not a guy that just takes all my clothes and throws them in the corner. Uh, Miss Jackson, that's what she does. And yet, still, and this is the truth, I'm not a clean freak, but I am sort of like put everything away, put it in the same place all the time, never move it around when you need it. And Miss Jackson a little more runs out. I tell her, put the keys in the same place. Put the keys in the same place. She runs out. I'm late, I'm late. Where are my keys? She's running around, looks in the pocket of her coat, knocks over the coat rack. They're not there. Looks here. They're not there. Looks over here. They're not there. Finally, she finds them, locates them. Where were you supposed to put them? And she knows. She knows. Now, I could have ragged her. I, I could have got on her. But we, we sort of, in the last several years, I'm saying we quarrel now all the time, it's called no nibble, no quibble. No nibble, no quibble. Now, Joe and Inget, you've been married for how many years? This? 17. 17 years. And you guys have got along 16 years. And you guys have gotten along fabulously the whole time, right? <laughs> Liars. <laughs> but, but, but Joe, you know her weaknesses. Inga, you know his weaknesses. I know it's like a big old book full, but you know Joe's weaknesses. And Drew and Alicia are the same. And Joe and, uh, what's your name again? I'm teasing you. I used to mess with her all the time about her last name. Joe and Renee, every married couple here, you know your spouse's weaknesses. And you know how to like just barely put the needle in. And if you don't, you're not enjoying your marriage life like you should. 
barely put it, and then pull it out. Say, honey, I didn't mean anything. I didn't mean to offend you. Sometimes I tease my wife. I say the craziest stuff. I mean, I say stuff that's like crazy. And she believes me sometimes. It's like, honey, obviously we're not going to leave the refrigerator door open all night because we're not going to do that. Well, you said you were going to do that. Honey, we're not going to sell your car tomorrow at a wholesale lot. Well, you, you said you would. Like you put so much gas in it all the time, I'm always paying for it. And she knows my weaknesses. And there's only one or two. But <laughs> we know each other. We know each other well. So we have to learn to work together. Get that. Number one, what's your job in the church? What does the Lord want you to do? Number one, uh, no, no. I'm not going to tell you what the Lord wants you to do. I'm going to give you five things and then we're done. Number one, it's going to take work. If we're going to take this verse right here, as David prayed, and say, Wilt thou not revive us again? Will that, by the way, I'll just take a moment for this. Have we ever been revived? Has this church ever been packed out? Has there ever been people basically, as we say, swinging from the chandeliers? I mean, think of the music program we've had and the soul winning program, the outreach programs we've had and our graduations and our funerals and our weddings and our vacation Bible schools. Man, we worked this building hard, haven't we? You know what this building is? This old pickup truck, baby. I, I mean, I like to keep the dents, you know, I like to keep a little wash on it, keep the rim a little bit clean. But as long as it gets in and starts and goes, this big old building right here is just an old pickup truck that we've been using for 20-some years, winning people to Christ, bringing Amen. people to church, yeah. baptizing, preaching the gospel, standing for what's right. And I want God to revive us again. Amen. And you do too. Yeah. You do too. So we pray, Lord, revive us again, that we may rejoice in thee. Habakkuk, minor prophet, said, Lord, what, wilt thou not revive thy work in the midst of the year? So number one, it's going to take work. He said, well, we only have a few. We once had so many. Well, you mean only a few like Gideon? Only a few like Jesus started out with 12, and now it's the here, it's Christianity? A few can make a difference if a few are bound together. They're going to take work. It's going to take, get ready for the ouch. It's going to take money. It's going to take prayer. It's going to take, it's going to require us keeping an eye out for the devil. And it's going to require us all to get along. Satan loves disunity. God loves harmony. God wants harmony in your heart for you. God wants harmony in your marriage for you. God wants peace in the decisions you have to make, tough decisions as an adult. God wants you to have that, that feeling of, of what, the, what the soldiers had, the Continental Army, as they marched and trudged and marched and trudged. And some froze to death. On the, some had no shoes. Nine miles from where they crossed and they got a late start. And one general ran up and said, oh, it was a rainy night, icy sleet night. Said, um, um, the men's gunpowder is wet. And, and try, I guess, I don't know what he's trying to do, avoid the situation with General Sullivan. And Washington said, then tell the men to use the bayonets. He wouldn't be dissuaded. He wouldn't be turned back. He said, bless God, we're marching. And Washington, being a Christian, believed in the great I am, believed in the providence of God. And they marched and they took and they captured and they fought and they outsmarted that sly old fox they call Cornwallis, the sly fox of Britain. Yet it turned out he got hoodwinked by George Washington, setting the fires and splitting. Exit stage left, as they used to say. Uh, remember the cartoons when they said that? Who said that? Snagglepuss? The leopard? Why, man, you call me Snagglepuss. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Exit, stage left. No, we got to work. We got to pray. Got to get along. Got to give. Got to be honest. Got to keep an eye out for the devil. And I believe if we do those things to the best of our personal ability, fall, get back up, fall, get back up, I believe God can bless this church like he did once again. Maybe not with the numbers, but I don't know. Maybe more, but definitely with the spirit. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Miss Jennifer, you come. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I want you to think about the message now. Pick something out. Pick anything out. And say, okay, I think that's what I'll concentrate on. Because if you don't, you're going to be thinking about something else. And you want your mind to be capture every thought, bring it into the obedience of Christ. What's the Lord saying to you right now? Of course, you want him to revive the church. But we all have to work together. We all have to uh, gung-ho. I think that's a Chinese. It means all, we all work together. 
We have to give. We have to, um, uh, we have to pray. We have to get along. And God wants revival for you today. Maybe a family needs revival. Maybe a marriage needs revival. Maybe a ministry. Maybe a business. But God said, uh, David said, revive us, Lord, revive us, that we might praise thee. So we want this morning for God to revive us in any way, in any area that we might Praise him. Now, just a minute. Miss Jennifer is going to start to play on the very first note. I want you to stand up. I know you can hear me. Now, if you can't stand, I see Brother Kevin laboring up here, knees. If you can't stand, God understands. If you can't stand, it's easier to use the altar if you stand and walk down here. And I'll say this. You say, Preacher, I, it's hard for me to stand. I want to pray in my pew. Why don't you do this for the Lord then? Why don't you stand up when I say, when Miss Jennifer begins to play, let's all stand up. And if you're going to pray where you sit, then you sit right back down. If it's a struggle to stand up, and I know it is for some of you, God knows your heart. You're not, you don't have to do it for, for the preacher. Do it for him. I want you to pray. What is it? Your home, your child rearing, your marriage, your finances, your relationships. We sure want the Lord to revive this church. And I want the Lord to revive me, and I want him to revive you. And I hope you'll come. Miss Jennifer, you play. We're all standing. Miss Jennifer's playing just as I am. You come today. I, there's got to be something in there. There's got to be some prayer that caught your attention. Some subject or topic or emotion. Some voice from the Holy Spirit. Teenagers coming. And take your time. Man, we no hurry. I've been to churches where they play 30 verses. 30 verses. That's good, young lady. That's good. That's good. Revive thy work in the midst of years. Boy, that's me. I'm definitely in the tail end, I think. I'm in the midst of you like the pips like the Van Zulans, like the Goebbels, like Brother Wayne. We're all in the midst of years. And I pray the Lord will revive me. And you pray for me, I'll pray for you. Revive thy work, O Lord. Think about when your best Christian days were. Think about when you were first married, first dating. Think about when you brought the little one home from the hospital. Think about your feelings when you were born again and you were baptized and you, you begin to grow. Oh, Lord, you pray. Lord, revive your work in me. Lord, revive the, the desire to be a parent, the love I had for my children, the attention I gave my spouse. folks with their head bowed and their eyes closed talk to the Lord say hey God it's me hey God it's me he's going to say I know who you are a simple prayer Lord please revive your work in me that's all they prayed they didn't pray big flower Lord revive thy work in me Thank you for the truth of the Bible. Thank you for uh, the people's attention. Thank you for um, bringing some more humility, humbling me, having me preach without these, these teeth here. Um, difficult, Lord, but thank you for the opportunity. I pray you bless each one that came. You know their hearts. You know their souls. You know their burdens. You know their, their um, um, breaking point. So I pray each of us, bless each of us, help each of us to grow Revive thy work in us this year. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Luke, tap Caden on the shoulder. Brother Kevin, you come. Let's sing. We'll never say goodbye in glory in the morning over yonder. We'll never say goodbye in glory. We'll never say goodbye.
side of there.